Hello and welcome to Modern Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Nick. And I'm Alistair. And this fortnight, after all that Oscar business last time, we're now doing, I guess, a me episode, in which we cover not one, but two superhero things. First up, of course, it's the latest Marvel Cinematic Universe epic, Ant-Man Quantumania, in which Paul Rudd gets real tiny. And then we will be looking at Extraordinary, a new gross-out superhero sitcom on Disney+. Plus. But before all of that, Alistair, what else you got? Well, I recently took a very long plane journey for the first time since the pandemic, which meant uh, I got to enjoy some Paramount Plus, which is um, yes, another yes, another <laughs> streaming service. Uh, which imagine I do, the luxury. Imagine. I mean, imagine that. Yeah, which I do do not have. I, I gather they've grabbed the rights to Yellow Jackets season two, so I may soon have to imagine, but I haven't yet. Yeah, yeah, that's true, and obviously like a lot of Star Trek. But uh, the main thing I enjoyed is, on this is the new Halo TV show, which is yeah set in the universe began by the Halo video games and I think expanded with books and you know online films and things like that. But this is yeah a full Halo TV series, and yeah Halo is something that I've been like aware of over the years. Played a bit of some of the games, but I'm not like a super mega fan and like know kind of the universe inside out but it is like a cool space adventure video game first person shooter and yeah this tv show manages to translate that you know quite well into a kind of serialized streaming service show you know it's all arc plot it's yeah similar to a lot of sci-fi streaming service shows it's got a lot of action and things like that fair amount of mystery they um made the what is probably a controversial decision to show the Master Chief's face in the uh, the TV show. In the video game, he wears a suit and a helmet. I guess partly because they realise if he's going to be the main character of a TV show, we need an actor who can actually emote, not just a sort of big metal face. Um, but yeah, if you you're... Weaklings, uh, weaklings. If the Mandalorian can do it, you can do it, Halo, come on. Yeah, yeah, I think the Mandalorian managed to prove that you can have a this entirely helmeted main character, apart from a few key scenes. I mean, a lot of like MCU and other related properties, as we've discussed in this podcast, always have a thing that like Spider-Man or Iron Man must lose their mask at a crucial point during a fight so the actor can, you know, emote a bit. So I think they've kind of picked up that idea and gone with it. Yeah, yeah. I must admit, I know nothing about Halo, to be honest. I kind of assumed it had reached a sort of post-story stage of gaming with Halo, where there might not even be a mythology beyond there's a space marine, he's got to shoot the stuff. Come on, guys, you know why we're here. Yeah. But it's possible I'm just being cynical about the story value of Halo. There actually is a whole story. Well, I assume there's plenty of people who just play it just to just to shoot the sort of bug-like aliens. But, yeah, I mean, it's got an uh, arc plot that runs across the, the series of games and things like that. I mean, I think the story seems to be something that Halo leaned into quite a lot. In fact, I seem to remember back when I used to read gaming magazines, an article basically saying that, like, is Halo's obsession with narrative getting a bit too much as they try to weave story into the the multiplayer arena bit of the game which is usually just where people go in and blast each other which is probably again maybe going a bit too far it's an interesting universe with the conflict between the humans and um an alien alliance called the covenant over sort of vast ring world like structures called halos yeah it's not hugely original when it comes to sci-fi plotting but it is enough for a video game and enough to create a sort of the mystery you need for a for a tv show one of the annoying things about it is that there was only the first three episodes on the british airways in flight entertainment system so i was like damn it this is why they give you a bit of paramount plus for free to get you hooked (laughs) And are you hooked? Are you now going to subscribe to see the rest? I would like to see. I would like to see how it ends. Yeah, I could recommend this show if you're a fan of the video games or if you're into you know just science fiction in general. So yeah, I would like to see how it ends. It does seem to be that the plot of the show is quite similar to the video games, so I guess there probably won't be many surprises. But on the other level, it's just seeing how they do it is part of the fun. Just as like if you go to see. Hamlet or Othello well you probably know how it ends it's more seeing about you know how it's done this time and in terms of how it's done is are we talking like very slow very talky very atmospheric premium telly stuff kind of like this is something we're not going to review yet but like The Last of Us or is it a bit more sort of action orientated run and shoot run and shoot run and shoot it's definitely um, action orientated I think they've got the notes that like yeah this is a first person shooter video game bring the the action to this you know each episode has like at least one or so like sort of major battle sequences or you know action sequences yeah and they've certainly got a pretty good effects budget yeah it's not a sort of slow ponderous 
thoughtful series. It's more of a schlocky adventure, which is kind of what you want for some in-flight entertainment to distract you from the fact that you are 40,000 feet above the, the surface of the <laughs> earth and part of your brain is freaking out about that idea because the animal part realises that's not natural. Okay, and Halo doing its bit to keep you sane in those circumstances. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So yeah, I'm not sure if it's worth subscribing to Paramount Plus in and of itself, unless you're like a huge fan of Halo, but I would say that, yeah, if you've got the service, especially for Star Trek and Yellow Jackets and Top Gun, which is yeah, also in there, this is also worth watching for your, for your entertainment value. Nice, maybe one day when I subscribe to Paramount Plus to see Yellow Jackets and have watched everything else I want to watch on there. Yeah, if you uh, run out of things to watch, this is worth giving a go. Anyway, so I've been watching entertainment high in the sky. What have you been up to for the last few weeks, Nick? Still in streaming TV, but possibly at a different end of the scale, I have been watching the new fourth season of Borgen. Well, I say new. This was released last year, and I've only just gotten around to it. But yeah, this is the sequel series, Borgen Power and Glory, released about ten years, I think, after the original three seasons of Borgen, the... Danish political drama about the long rise and rise and rise and occasionally fall of the first fictional female Prime Minister of Denmark, Birgitta Nubo. I think that's roughly how it's pronounced. And in this sequel series, it's been 10 years since Nubo was last in power. Well, was last seen by us being in power. And at this point, she's now in a coalition with another party. Yeah, she's Foreign Minister, the other party's leader is Prime Minister, and conflict erupts over the fact that they found some oil in Greenland, which, and this is something I had no idea about, so I'm just assuming that Borgen is telling me the complete truth about this. Greenland has this sort of uneasy relationship with Denmark, Maybe somewhat similar to the England-Scotland one, where they're sort of bound to each other, and there's this sort of vague desire for independence from the Greenland side. This is probably quite a loose metaphor, analogy thing. My apologies to any Scottish listeners offended. But there seems to be this desire for independence by Greenland, and Denmark insisting that Greenland aren't yet ready to go it alone. And it, anyway, they find oil in Greenland, and it leads to a long standoff over who gets the money from this oil. Nubo has to deal with a rebellion from within her own party of whether they should extract the oil at all and ruin the beautiful natural natural scenery of Greenland because it's a fairly liberal left party and you know they're, they're quite pro-climate and there's also Russia and China end up getting involved if you've ever wanted to see a tv show but actually does mention both Covid and the invasion of the Ukraine then this is the one for you uh yeah I'm pleased to say this is pretty good yeah this is a strong Borgen sequel if anything it's it may almost count as a return to form because although I don't have full critical recall of the last run of Borgen because it was again 10 years ago I do remember the third season actually being slightly disappointing and seeming a bit like they've maybe watched a bit too much West Wing and let it get a bit too idealistic and basic but yeah season four it's back to full moral complexity everyone's very conflicted it's never quite clear what the right thing to do is Nubo tries her best but often makes some quite bad choices and gets sucked into the wrong side of politics obviously they're also tackling fake news and so on and misinformation because you kind of got to these days in politics and yeah good show good show Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad it's good or is a return to form. Interesting that they decide to bring it right up to date and tackle very contemporary political issues. Yeah, yeah, I do respect their, their willingness to jump straight into the present day. Um, they've got an attempt to handle the existence of social media through the sort of on-screen tweets scrolling by. A lot of the characters I vaguely remember from the previous Van of Borgen are here, so the nostalgia is, card is definitely being played. But yeah, they haven't wallowed in the past so much that it's off-putting. It doesn't just feel like, oh, isn't it nice to see her? If anything, it's almost surprising how far they're sometimes willing to go, making Nubo somewhat unsympathetic in terms of the decisions she feels she has to make. Yeah, cool. That sounds very good. Yeah, the Borgen's got this sort of, yeah, quite exalted status, especially amongst fans of, like, political drama. A lot of people, yeah, you know, on various politics podcasts I listen to is often tipped as like this is like kind of the, one of the best depictions of politics like in fiction I think partly because of the moral complexity and the difficult choices people have to make yeah I used to love Borgen back in the day as I say I think the third season was a, a tiny bit of a dip but yeah it's still I think one of the best political shows I've seen do I want to say outside of the West Wing in terms of being a like a real depiction of the moral ambiguity of politics is probably better than the West Wing it's maybe not as entertaining as the West Wing but you know if you're looking for a real cut and thrust politics show and maybe you want something a bit more down and dirty than the West Wing. Yeah, I guess the, the strength of the West Wing obviously is Sorkin's brilliant ability to write drama. He's obviously just yeah, very, very good at just the craft of screenwriting and stuff. But then I've seen a bit of Borgen and from what I've seen, yeah, it is also very, very dramatic. You know, kind of you get sucked into this world. Yeah, it doesn't rely quite as much on, you know, banter and chat and characterisation quite as much. I mean, you do like 
you know, the, the two of the main characters, but you don't get this whole world of lovable supporting characters. A lot of the others are just kind of doing their jobs. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed this. I, I thought maybe it would be a, a difficult re-entry after 10 years because I, I opted not to go back and rewatch the whole of Borgen. But even though there was not any massive honking exposition to tell me exactly what happened, it turns out, yeah, no, this was really easy to come back to. If you liked Borgen back in the day and haven't watched this for some reason, I mean, it did take me about six months to watch it then highly recommended if you haven't seen Borgen at all and you like political dramas then it's all on Netflix just watch the whole thing yeah sounds great it's an interesting one that they picked this up because yeah I always thought Borgen was a bit of like a, a cult classic you know yeah I'm not sure like how popular it is in the mainstream but then Netflix decided to do another se- series of this I guess it goes to show how well received the original show was that they feel it's popular enough to do uh, to do another series yeah I mean I'm not surprised they wanted Borgen the original on their service because you know it has as you say a cult following and there's definitely some people who might subscribe to see it but yeah the fact they chose to make more is i guess a bit of a a weird moment of the peak content years which some say might now be coming to an end i think i've read quotes based on a brief google from the lead actor saying that she thinks she's really done now and there probably won't be any more yeah and if so it's a fair ending i'm not gonna spoil anything but it's a decent ending oh cool yeah it's good that it goes out on a high as well you know and they just don't keep like making the show indefinitely with slowly like declining levels of quality well yeah especially considering that i thought the last season of the regular show actually was a bit disappointing and yeah i'm happy for them to come back and like dexter only not quite as dramatic a shift do a much better series to finish on <laughs> Next up this episode, we will be discussing Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Ant-Man is coasting through life after saving the universe in Avengers Endgame. When his family is abducted and taken into the quantum realm, he must fight against its tyrannical ruler Kang to save their lives. We saw this new MCU film recently. Nick, what did you think of it? Once again, this is a, a recent MCU film, somewhat in the vein of, say, Eternals, where my expectations have been battered down a bit by some slightly lukewarm to bad reviews. And, yeah, it's definitely an odd one. I enjoyed it more than I expected to, in that I found the plot sort of tolerable enough in a sort of Saturday morning cartoon way. It bops along. I think Paul Rudd is doing a lot to make this fun. There's some interesting sort of Ant-Man advancement concepts here involving going into the quantum realm and establishing exactly what Michelle Pfeiffer's character was doing in the lost years. Uh, it definitely feels a bit lightweight, the Special effects are definitely a bit ropey. Yeah, it does deal slightly awkwardly with its obligations towards the wider Marvel Cinematic Universe. The need to set up Kang, the Jonathan Majors character, as the big new villain. I think I did ultimately like it just for the the fact that it does still keep the character stuff front and centre and give them basically a story. Although it is quite a lightweight story. I think it felt quite mid-season in a way. Which may be one reason why the movie critics have found it quite, I don't know, annoying. This is definitely not the most cinematic of Marvel films. Between the bad special effects and the fact that the story feels very, here's a random day in the life of Ant-Man. It definitely doesn't feel like the most substantial standalone experience but i had an okay time there are definitely better marvel films yeah i also had sort of yeah low expectations going into this party because of a lot of people online saying that they they didn't like it and i think the disney competence machine is very much in play here there's enough humor to make it you know entertaining there's enough action to make it entertaining you don't feel like you've been aggressively robbed of your money for paying to see this um you get you know pretty good two hours entertainment I don't know. I don't know if I'd have felt I that robbed if I just stayed at home and watched it on streaming, to be honest. As I say, the visuals definitely aren't the strongest point here. No, no. I mean, they've tried to, like, create this whole sort of world of the quantum realm, which is, you know, sort of like another sort of domain to the Marvel MCU. And they put a lot of, you know, time into coming up with all these different bizarre characters that live there. But I, I, I don't know if it's just the famous Marvel cheapness. It does, yeah, look a bit sort of ropey at times and does, like, lean quite heavily on CGI. Like we noticed in the end credits, there's almost no credits for location photography but just like reels and reels and reels of of effects and animators and I think although you know I'm not as down on CGI in films as some critics are I feel this film probably leans on it a bit too heavily yeah every so often I mean there's a few sort of good sci-fi concepts and bits of like knowing weirdness baked into this film like some of the sort of CGI character creature design is quite fun in a silly way like some of the weird creatures they encounter both in the sort of rank and file of this rebellion army and the Modoc creature the sort of secondary villain is quite a fun design in a silly way yeah that's a sort of level of knowingly weird silliness that kind of works but outside of that a lot of the backgrounds and a lot of the general vague supporting characters are just kind of cgi fuzz and it doesn't quite land 
Yeah, you don't get a real sense of this being like a whole world. The kind of the, the characters that are in the foreground kind of look quite good, but like the background kind of makes it look a bit sort of fake. I mean, the Saturday morning cartoon analogy that you mentioned is actually quite a good one. Again, it, you know, sometimes when it looks like a sort of cartoon that's been sketched a bit too cheaply, it you know it doesn't feel quite like believable. I also kind of. I do disagree, I think, a bit on the Modoc character. I feel that, like, the way they kind of CGI'd someone's head to be massive was <laughs> just the wrong side of Uncanny Valley. I guess it's, like, it's MCU and, you know, it's supposed to be a bit sort of weird and silly and, you know, it's kind of funny and you're not supposed to take it too seriously, which I liked. But I did, every time I did see Modoc on screen, I was a bit like, Ugh. That looks a bit freakish, but not freakish in a kind of creepy way. Freakish in a way sort of like, my brain is not happy with that. It just looks a bit <laughs> weirdly <laughs> wrong. And it's actually quite distracting. It's sort of the way they sort of horizontally stretched his head to make yeah. it fit that weird sort of almost square box. Yeah, yeah. I must admit, it does perhaps err uh, slightly towards distorted image rather than like stretched flesh which I think mm. is maybe what you actually want. Yeah, yeah. I guess they don't want something that looks really, like, dark and grotesque because, you know, they're aiming for a sort of PG-13 audience or 12A in the UK. So sort of the true horrors of Modoc is probably not something that people would take seriously. But I just feel that, like, it didn't look quite cartoony enough to be funny, but it kind of looked a bit too real to be just a bit odd. Yeah, I enjoyed Modoc conceptually, but perhaps they didn't quite pull that off, which is a shame. The real-life actors back in the real world are doing a decent amount to make this work, especially Paul Rudd and Jonathan Majors. Paul Rudd, as I think has been said before more than once, is one of the more likeable, relatable, charming actors in this stable. Possibly doesn't get quite as much credit as he should compared to the Chris's for his ability to keep this stuff anchored just by seeming like a, you know, decent, charismatic dude. But yeah, he pulls this off. I think the fact that the plot of this film is still sort of followable, even though the environment they're in is sometimes just kind of mush, is a lot on Paul Rudd being a, a good lead. Yeah, he does likeable every man very well. Yeah, and his character doesn't really have the strongest arc, to be honest. It's, again, one of the ways in which this feels a bit like, a, again, a mid-season TV show episode. Ant-Man doesn't actually go through a huge amount in his third film, but nonetheless, Paul Rudd, just as a presence, is doing a good job. Yeah, the main character arc, I don't think, sort of worked brilliantly. Yeah, I mean, it's just got quite a you know, straightforward arc. that He's coasting through life, and then he now must rise to be a hero again. But his family are kidnapped and taken away, so if anything's going to prompt you to be a hero, that's probably it. Yeah, I mean, I mean they introduced a new sort of, I think, the cast for the third time, his daughter, this time now a teenager, who is now moving increasingly towards being a sort of size-changing hero in her own rights, presumably to join the Teen Avengers team they seem to be very slowly moving towards. Yeah, yeah that works well. You know, you kind of get get the sort of family dynamic the sense well they've got quite a lot of yeah well-respected actors obviously yeah michael douglas and michelle pfeiffer very good the older players and um evangelina lily does almost nothing yeah yeah but she is she is there her name is in the title but she does almost nothing yeah i think there's not much wasp in ant-man in the wasp quantumania apart from like a few key scenes but yeah you kind of get like the sort of family dynamic they're building up the daughter so i guess this film already has like two size changing superheroes in it do they need like the third one yeah, I think if Ant-Man does have an arc here, sort of the main primary character relationship is probably building this dynamic with the daughter as the sort of teen size changer. And, you know, and that bit does kind of work, but the Wasp does get kind of left out as a result. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of one of the core things to the Ant-Man character is that he has a daughter, he's an everyday dad as well as a superhero, which is what makes him relatable, things like that. Similar to how, you know, Spider-Man is trying to be an everyday kid, things like that. By mixing in the, the everyday relatable aspects of the characters, it makes you easy to identify with them during the superhero stuff. I mean, to be honest, I think the everyday relatable aspects of Ant-Man is kind of almost what you miss from this. I mean, a lot of the fun parts from the previous films were the sort of size-changing games they play with everyday objects. And the fact that there's absolutely none of that really in this at all is i don't know i guess i can't fault them for arguably i can't fault them for trying something different as i have slagged off sequels before for not trying something different but i i don't know if ant-man spending almost literally an entire film from beginning to end in a world of cgi fuzz was the level of difference i wanted no i mean i do completely agree that kind of the size changing like real life objects thing was kind of the most fun aspects of the previous films which isn't in this i mean it is a bit of a problem that a hero who's main like deal is that he can change size by putting him in this fictional world where everything is kind of made up there's no size comparison so it's kind of hard to tell sometimes how big or small he is because you know you need kind of everyday objects to you know associate with the scale you know the first film 
had the brilliant bit when there's like a massive action scene that takes place on a model train set which is obviously yeah really really clever when you can have like the drama of someone hanging off the side of a speeding train and then zoom out to see it's just like a little plastic thing going around in a small circle there's nothing like that in this no and i did kind of miss it obviously again you don't want to repeat yourself but i feel like you come close to moving away with what made those films fun but yeah what we have instead is the quantum realm and kang the introduction of kang yeah and as you say uh, jonathan majors i thought did uh, did well making you know the villain part seem like a, again a believable person yeah he does, there's a lot of good character development for kang here sometimes feels a bit out of place in an ant-man story a point that kang i think makes in dialogue a couple of times but he does his bit he's very very charismatic he does hold the screen well enough between paul rudd and jonathan majors there are at least good people to watch yeah yeah i guess this is a lot of setup as you say for you know future kang stories i guess they're building him up to be the next big villain replacing Thanos they need to establish him as a character and also you know it's gonna be difficult to fill the space that Thanos left uh, you know partly because they managed to actually get that character to work quite well with the mainstream audience who weren't familiar with sort of deeper Marvel lore and Thanos but actually managed to get it a point where they're like Thanos is like a known thing in mainstream culture now you know referenced in sitcoms or things like that and they have to do that again which now that they've got a new villain which you know they're kind of working hard to do that here I mean having Jonathan Majors as a actor who can like emote helps with that yeah I mean it's, it's a different approach in that Thanos did really turn up on screen and have like a character arc and major time face to face with the audience until to be honest till infinity war he had like a few scenes in guardians of the galaxy and was that basically it yeah pretty much and like maybe like a few appearances in like post-credit sequences yeah so you didn't get any substantial thanos time until infinity war whereas we've already had far more time with jonathan majors kang uh yeah it's gonna be interesting to see if they can pull off a story arc with this much exposure and this much depth over the course of many many films and tv shows because i think one way that the infinity arc kind of works is that it wasn't actually that complicated it wasn't actually that deep it didn't actually have that much ongoing nuance in the air it just had the infinity stones as MacGuffins and the knowledge that thanos was going to collect them for some reason and eventually he turns up he did all that in a single film and then the next thing happens you didn't really have an ongoing journey of Thanos all you really had was that the Infinity Stones existed and, and were in films and yeah interested to see if they're going to try and do something more complicated with Kang on like an ongoing story or is it just going to be the case that you know a Kang variant is going to turn up in various things and then die yeah I think you're right that the kind of the way Thanos and the Infinity plotline worked quite well was its simplicity which is probably what allowed it to bleed through into mainstream culture because it's an easy idea. I guess the thing with Kang is that they're kind of introducing, or, well, they have introduced time travel as a crucial element to this. And I do feel that time travel can create, like, lots and lots of complexities. It's, like, famously difficult thing to write well. I think even, sorry to drag Harry Potter into this, but I think even didn't J.K. Rowling say that, like, she regretted adding time travel to the Harry Potter universe because it just made it, like, too complicated. And, you know, we can see the mess that Doctor Who gets in with sort of convoluted time travel plots. I mean, the thing about Doctor Who is that you just accept it. You know, it doesn't make sense. Each episode makes sense. But if you think about the whole Doctor Who arc, it sort of doesn't make much sense. I mean, obviously, there's great shows like Dark and brilliant films like Primer that work are planned very meticulously and work really hard to basically be like, right, we're going to address all the loopholes and cover absolutely everything. But they have got a lot of complexity to them. I think that they're probably leaning more towards a kind of, yep, just accept it and go with it sort of thing. Um, I'm just concerned that like they might end up in a space of people being like, hey, what? Didn't this has happened before that? And then like that happens after, you know, so, so it's not a place you really want people to be you know, when they're a casual viewer in, in a sort of blockbuster cinema audience. Yeah, I don't know. We are very early in the Kang storyline. And so far, Jonathan Majors is very charismatic. And I'm interested to see where it goes next, which looks like being in the second season of Loki sometime later this year. But yes, he does kind of stomp on this film a bit. I mean, having read a lot of comics in my life, this does read a bit like one of those mini series you sometimes get from Marvel or DC indeed. In the build up to a big crossover storyline called something like Ant-Man colon prelude to Kang War, in which... You know, it's sort of an Ant-Man story, but it's also, he's kind of superfluous, or at least he's kind of just a vehicle to 
show Kang doing something, which you know won't have an ending because it's just trailing on to the later Kang War storyline. And yeah, this is kind of one of those, which is another thing that makes it feel kind of mid-season in a way that may well annoy the movie critics. Yeah, yeah, there's very much very much an element to that. But then again, the sort of conflict between Kang and Ant-Man, uh, you know, is the bit of this film that kind of worked well. Kang's the tyrannical ruler of the quantum realm. There's the people who are subjugated under him. They sort of rise up against him in a big battle scene at the end that was kind of a lot of fun you know when you've got like a good actor playing a big baddie being a sort of like you know i am evil i will kill everyone i will conquer the universe lovable hero basically standing up to him even with the sort of side helping of some i guess political analogies thrown in such as you know i guess like people standing up to tyranny there's you know one point obviously because there's lots of ants in this being ant-man i think you know there's one bit where michael douglas says like you know i know socialism is a bad word or something like that was you know <laughs> and then like i guess kind of hinting towards the fact that like the ants of some kind of ideal <laughs> socialist society versus kang's tyranny yeah and kind of monarchy so yeah there's there's even like a bit of bit of politics flown in i'm not sure how socialist the ant world is considering they literally have a, a leadership cast some individuals are like born to be the queens so i'm not exactly sure how well that works as a political analogy but i'm surprised that an mcu film actually yeah, dropped the s-bomb <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's true. We may decry this film for being a Saturday morning cartoon, but really it's more of a political treatise. It's a radical story about how, <laughs> you know, egalitarianism will win out over extreme hierarchy and, you know, authoritarianism. So, yeah, that was fun. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, mostly it's a film about Paul Vard being a likeable dude. Oh, there's a good sequence with many, many, many Paul Vards. I enjoyed that part. I thought that was a, one of the few parts of this film where they more or less nailed the visuals and it was actually really entertaining. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, and a good combination of being kind of funny in a silly way, but also having quite a lot of dramatic tension as well. So yeah, the kind of that's the sort of yeah, MCU at its best. Kind of funny but also good drama. Yes, and ultimately at the end, weirdly kind of inspiring. <sighs> yeah, it's a strange film. It's a bit of a messy plot, it's a bit weighed down with its continuity, but the characters just about shine through in a way that you can still sort of follow and like, even if you're sort of thinking, Well that looks stupid. This seems a lot of exposition. I think if you're looking to hate the MCU and like kind of deliberately tear them down from their dominant position in charge of cinema, then this is a film that people can go out and find things that they won't like in it. And, you know, I don't want to name names, but I do feel that some Twitter commentators have gone in to dislike this film because it's got flaws. As I said, I think it's not the most cinematic of films, as I said earlier. So I can see why movie critics who are sick of mcu dominance have felt that this is one they could really go off on you know and i think we said before on the podcast they're like yeah when marvel have a misstep people suddenly go like it's over it's doomed this is the end of you know or the beginning of the fall of marvel and like you know it'll all be ruined and it's like well i don't know guardians of the galaxy 3 comes out in a couple of months and that's probably going to be funny and entertaining and good and then it'll all be back to as it was obviously the mcu can't continue forever nothing does but you know i think they can recover from a, a slight falter we'll see i do think this is another all right ish film in a, a year or two where they have produced slightly more films that are close to all right ish than they have before so it would be nice if the quality films are picked up a bit i did like wakanda forever but a lot of the films before wakanda forever were a bit too close to all right ish on the spectrum yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much so, yeah. The quality control may be faltering a bit. They are apparently slowing down on the release of the TV shows, which I can't say I mind. Last year was a lot of Marvel telly, wasn't it? It was a lot. It was a lot, yeah. Finally, this episode, we will be discussing Extraordinary, a new British superhero comedy series from Disney+. Plus. In a world where everyone has a superpower, Jen is the only person with no abilities. She also has a crummy job, is having a fling with an arsehole, and is a disappointment to her mum compared to her overachieving sister. Jen and her two flatmates attempt to sort out her life and find her power, whilst also adopting a new cat with a secret. We've seen the first series of this comedy show, Nick. What do you think of it? Yeah, I really enjoyed this. This was great, good, solid fun. It reminded me of a bit of the resurgence in sort of slightly silly, fun British genre TV that happened around the time of Doctor Who in the sort of late 2000s, very early 2010s, and before us being human, misfits, Merlin, and several more. And this would put me a fist in fine with that wave in, in the best possible way. If I wanted to draw direct comparisons, it's probably misfits, although it's more of a sitcom, whereas misfits did occasionally aspire to drama. But the irreverent, sweary, relatable superpower stuff, the occasional moments of fun grossness, it's not quite as gross as Misfits occasionally went, but it does have its times. And yeah, 
fundamentally it's a fun flat share sitcom which just uses the fact that everyone has superpowers to make the protagonist feel more like an outcast i enjoyed it a lot yeah this was very good it's very funny a high density of jokes you know always very good even though it's sort of set in a yeah a super powered world it's very much a sitcom the plot and character are very much just in service of making humor and a lot of the humor actually comes from the the character interaction the sort of slightly silly and a sort of absurd people that populate this world there's a whole bit with one of the flatmates starting a vigilante group which is a sort of you know fairly normal superhero fodder and it's just kind of there just to create humor i guess almost all good urban vigilante plots have been done at this point so making it there for humor is kind of probably the best way forward yeah i think that storyline if anything probably got the shortest end of the stick i guess you might think that the sort of super team stuff is where the juicy satire lives but honestly it's kind of low hanging food in a world where you've already got stuff like the boys and the show is clearly a bit more correctly i think a bit more interested in the other characters who have stuff that's a bit more specific to this series yeah i mean i like the way that like this is basically a sort of directionless young person sharing a flat sitcom but yeah with added superpowers so like yeah one of the you know the other flatmates her superpower she can talk to the dead and she's got you know a job in law firms sort of sorting out wills and things like that and it's just generally a kind of used as a sort of i've got some skills but you know nothing transformative or like amazing or that's in like super high demand you know i've got you know a bit of a life you know money coming in but you know not something amazing and it's kind of you know what am i doing with my life where am i going sort of pressures on the character and the superhero stuff is just there to have a way of unpacking that sort of malaise that a lot of people have in their early 20s yeah and i guess again that's something fairly heavily explored in sitcoms i mean jesus christ that's almost the premise of friends but yeah, it started a very sort of enjoyable, knowingly silly, sort of almost at times nihilistic, but not enough to be completely off-putting. I think the main character, Jen, is a very good sort of classic British sitcom, awful yet lovable character, in that they don't shy away from at times making her actively unpleasant, or at least actively selfish to a point that makes her quite unlikable. And yeah, she's paired well with her sort of long-suffering best friend, who still has enough personality to not be a tedious wet blanket. Again, it's quite a, a straightforward dynamic, the slightly off-the-rails one and the sort of long-suffering one. But hey, it works here, the, the actors playing them are both very good, and it helps that they've probably given the sort of the nice girl character the most interesting superpower. Yeah, I guess these are sort of, yeah, archetypes of sitcoms they're dealing with. But I guess, you know, what it comes down to is, you know, is it funny? And obviously, yeah, it is funny. They keep it moving. There's usually two to three plots per episode. The episodes are only sort of like 20, 25 minutes. There's a high density of jokes. It's pretty funny across the board, which is what really what makes it work. Yeah, and the other character, Gizlord, played by Luke Rolleston. <laughs> Gizlord, yeah. <laughs> That, that is his name in the show, folks. He has not currently been given any other name. Yeah, he's great. He's very, very, very good sort of physical comedy there. He's one of these characters who just every expression he does is kind of funny. Yeah. His gimmick, which is kind of a plot spoiler, so I'm not going to spoil it, is extremely silly, but it does just lead to this character who just looks incredibly traumatised and baffled by everything that's going on, and it really works. Yeah, yeah. The show is really, really cast. He is he is really funny. One of the things I actually like about it is that it's it's largely a cast of, of unknowns. I don't know, maybe like veteran comedy watchers might be aware of some of these people beforehand. The only famous face in this is is the mum played by Shauna McSweeney, who obviously was in Derry Girls as the as the nun in that. She's obviously very funny. But the fact that this is kind of a cast of unknowns means that you can really kind of like get lost in the characters. You're not kind of really thinking of anything else. They very much embody the characters and, you know, that kind of makes the whole thing more believable. Yeah, it's like meeting some new friends, some new, sometimes slightly awful, long-suffering friends. The Cash character, the best friend's boyfriend, probably gets kind of the shortest end of the stick again because i don't think the super team plot which is what he does most of the time is the best bit although he does get a lot of good stuff in the last episode where they use his superpower of time reversal to create a nice sort of almost time travel plot twist misdirection it's not like full-on doctor who timey-wimey bullshit but it's very well played yeah yeah the way that yeah they played his superpower of other people's perspective so you can't quite tell what's going on it's clever yeah 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 it took me a while to work out what was going on there you know it's a sort of a good build up and also the fact that he's another you know slightly ineffectual character in that you know he doesn't really have a job he's a bit of a slacker he's kind of got grandiose ideas but follows up on almost none of it so again we're dealing with archetypal characters here that make good sitcom material well yeah they're all sort of underachievers lovable losers some might say even the, the carry character the best friend who is kind of a the closest his show has to a sort of career focused high achiever is sort of suffering from the fact that she's kind of a wet blanket yeah, yeah. And gets walked over by people a lot and therefore sometimes doesn't really rise in her job 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so it's all it's all very relatable. You know, very charming. I like that it's very much sort of I don't know captures modern London. I think very well. It's clearly like shot on location in actual streets in London where people actually live. You know, it's it's set in London, but there's you know not a shot of Palace of Westminster or Tower Bridge to be seen. But there is you know they do live above a shop in Hackney. Um, there is like a bit when they go to a pub, which is clearly supposed to be like an antique pub. They mention one of the characters being a craft beer guy. Moth Club is mentioned at one point, and there's someone who's been to Moth Club for live music has very much enjoyed it. It's nice to see it get mentioned. Yeah, I think they live above a closed-down comic shop, which I'm sure is commentary on some level, or at least a shout-out to the, the comics. They're very, very, very distantly homaging. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of it is, as you say, the fact that there's just some classic sitcom basics. Like, there's the, the episode where a new friend gets in the way of the established dynamic. There's the episode where they return to their old school and they get sort of sucked back into their old arguments. And yeah, it's all pulled off with good form, whilst adding in a bit extra from the whole superpowers thing. Yeah, they use the superpower thing to add another dimension to it. So, like, when they go back to the old school, they meet a former bully whose superpower is that they can relive memories. And then, obviously, that means they can, like, objectively look back at the things they did, which is obviously realise that they were a horrible person and now they're trying to do better. And, you know, so they're taking a superhero, you know, science fiction element and used it as a way to crack open character, you know, which is... Again, yeah, the kind of what you do. So they're getting to the point of what is a reformed bully like, you know, and how do you get to that process? So, yeah, they're adding this kind of extra level on top of, you know, the sort of sitcom episode that most shows do, which is, yeah, the old school reunion. Yeah, it's fairly straightforward in a lot of ways, but no, it's, it's really good. It has just enough sort of anarchic energy. Again, you vaguely think of Misfits to feel sort of fresh and fun in the face of a lot of sitcoms about relatable people in their 20s searching for direction. Yeah. I mean, the plot, you know, the character plot is something you can you get hooked on. I like the fact that, like, you know, each credit bit has a, well, yeah, I guess a superhero mid-credit sequence kind of setting up the next episode. But it's always, like, usually funny, short, and something really makes you go, like, ooh, I want to watch the next episode to find out what happens there. Yeah, it's a good balance of some modern comedy shows sometimes, I think, get a bit carried away with threading in ongoing subplots to the point where they basically morph into comedy dramas and don't focus as much on jokes. Whereas this, I think, has a good line in fedding through a few subplots while still the primary goal here is to actually be funny and build to some sort of comic conclusion in each episode yeah and each one kind of stands alone as a sort of tight 20 minutes or so of comedy so yeah i mean it's early in the year but yeah as new sitcoms go this is among the best i've seen for a while good work disney yeah yeah it's definitely very funny i thought it had great music as well it was really good like flaming lips i think were in at one point they also used several times an episode the opening riff and drum section of pepper by butthole surfers which, aside from being a hilarious named band, it is a really sort of just distinctive kind of little guitar and drum bit. And the fact that they used it just to kind of punctuate scenes, similar to the slap bass that's used in Seinfeld, you know, or things like that, means that, I don't know, it's a nice little recurring motif. Partly it worked well, but it's, it's even better if you if you notice the, what the song is. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought it had a bit, a bit of style, this show. As, as you say, there was the little musical stings, the fact that it was always quite colourful, the fact that it always... Yeah, its vision of London always seemed quite sort of distinct and lived in. It didn't look like they just, you know, found a generic flat set and shot it straight on. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's got it's got a sense of style, yeah. Like, I thought the costuming was very good and, like, the set design and stuff. And, like, the flat feels lived in. It's got, like, full of, like, sort of weird things they clearly has collected over the years. Although it's quite big for people who... Two of them don't have really proper jobs. <laughs> And um, uh, yeah. uh, the, the classic friends criticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it works somehow. Maybe someone's yeah. mum is funneling them money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Occasionally, I found myself picking nits in the world building. Like, you know, would they have rules at the cat show concerning cats that are actually disguised human shapeshifters? But it's a comedy, and it is funny, so these things don't matter. It's probably yeah, uh, best not. Yeah, again, I don't know. Similar to what we were saying about time travel and Doctor Who, like digging into it too much because I guess these things can fall apart. I guess there is one thing I felt, which is the absurdity of many situations are slightly deflated by the fact that everyone has superpowers and everyone's aware that they have superpowers, which I guess would make things less weird. Like, there's one bit when they have to take a person to a vet's due to a series of comedy arcs that, you know, it's better that you just watch rather than uh, I explain. But I kind of felt that, like, the inherent absurdity of having to take a human being to a vet is kind of deflated by the fact, well, everyone has superpowers, so there's so much weird stuff going on in this world that people would be like, yeah, of course, person's at the vet. We can still think it's absurd, though. You know, we're still, we still live in the real world. Yes, yes, that is a good point, yeah. It does make us feel like this is a bit strange, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But, uh, but yeah, but it works overall. And yeah, the show is never far away from a, a silly one-liner, which is, you know, what, again, makes a, a good sitcom great. Yes, and also it's not above occasionally some slightly vank toilet humour, which I do always appreciate when it appears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As of the aforementioned Jizz Lord scene. <laughs> Okay, and that was Moderate Fantasy Violence for this fortnight. Thank you as ever for listening. If you want still more, go to moderatefantasyviolence.com and check out our, at this point, many, many previous episodes, plus occasional assorted other stuff. And if you enjoy it, then please go to your podcast application of choice or any other place which lets you review stuff and give us five stars. Thank you very much. You can also find more of us on Twitter, where we are at MFV Podcast, or you can find more from us on Twitter by searching for Moderate Fantasy Violence. You can find more from me on Twitter, where I'm at AlistairJR Ball, or get more of my writing at redtrainblog.com. And you can find more from me at NickMB on Twitter, nickbryan.com on the general internet, and also other places on other services. And yes, you can get still more from us by coming back next fortnight for the next episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence, in which we'll be covering the latest instalment of Lufa, this time a film, and then we'll be going to check out the viable smash of the year, the inevitable follow-up, spiritually at least, to Snakes on a Plane. Yes, it's Cocaine Bear. See you in two weeks for that. Bye. Bye. Bye.